Symbolic mortification. We're continuing our exploration of the Lacanian reconceptualization of the death drive. And in order to do that, we've got to explore and develop a series of themes. We're going to think a little bit about, extemporize, improvise about what symbolic mortification might be. Why is this so important? It's so important because if Lacan's theory is to work, if it's to be cogent, and that theory is represents a definitive move away from a kind of organic biological understanding of death drive. We need to be able to see how the symbolic is itself associated with death or is in some respects deathly. So I've tried to collect a series of thoughts and ideas. I put them up here on the board. We'll explore a series of them. But the first one we're going to begin with is to pick up where we left off. And we left off with the idea that the symbolic enables a certain form of repetition or a certain form of insistence, insistent types of repetition that might not be available without the symbolic. So I thought about a couple of ideas and um, one of them, starting right at the bottom of the blackboard here, is just to think about Christmas. What is it about the institution of Christmas that repeats? Well, there's a given date and you need a kind of symbolic system to note that date. So it comes around once a year, but you could say without a kind of symbolic framework, you wouldn't have the repetition of Christmas and not simply the calendar repetition, that as well, but also the fact of the various cultural signifiers that we utilize in this celebration of Christmas. So there's a certain type of repetition uh, you could even say a certain type of history is made possible and therefore historical repetition by virtue of there being a symbolic system. Now, take that another step further. Let's also remember that in Seminar 2 at around this time, Lacan is often emphasizing the machinic nature of the symbolic. The machinic nature of the symbolic, which has signifiers, which have chains, which unfold, which have momentum, all of these things we've discussed at some level before, and I've tried to note it down here by saying that the symbolic is in some respects machinic. Machinic in the sense that it is a system that produces, produces more signifiers, produces significations. It has momentum, it produces signifiers, it has momentum, it has agency. And I've discussed symbolic efficacy, or as sometimes it's referred to, symbolic efficacy. Claude Levi-Strauss's concept, which is one way of understanding the persistence of myths, the idea here being that once something is within the symbolic order and underwritten as of certain significance and has a kind of organizing cultural value, that thing stays within the symbolic, much like Christmas, you could say. It repeats. It's also important to remember here that also around the same time, Lacan is thinking about the instance of the signifier, the insistence of the signifier, that there are certain terms within a symbolic that insist, that repeat, that go on. So we've done a certain amount of work here to try to emphasize how there is an insistence or a repetition within the symbolic itself. That's very important to how Lacan wants to rethink the death drive. But we can also add that it's not simply that there is a kind of insistence, a kind of repetition. We could also add to that that it's this very type of insistence, this overwriting of symbolic terms, signifiers, cultural terms, that has a type of overwriting that, in a sense, to use Adrian Johnston's terms, cadaverizes the vital organic stuff of everyday natural life. So I've given a, a short, um, succinct version of his quote, but Adrian Johnston puts this nicely. He says, insofar as the denaturalization of nature brought about by the socio-cultural overwriting of vital being involves the colonization of the living, one could say that human life is under the dominance of a lifeless set of cadaverizing signifiers. Okay, so that's a slightly uh, complicated sentence. We can maybe boil it down to, as I've tried to put it here, in Johnston terms, we have a denaturalization of nature that's brought about by the socio-cultural overwriting of vital being. We have this moment of, or this ongoing, incessant production, machinic production of the symbolic, which overrides the symbolic mortification of spontaneous, actual, vital forms of living. And in my preparation for the lecture, I thought of an example. Okay, brace yourselves, brace yourselves. This is one way of thinking about it. How does the signifier overwrite the vitality of physical perception experience? And I, and I said, okay, look at my tummy. And I looked at this. And I 
do I see this? Do I perceive this directly? As in a phenomenological account, we may like to just directly perceive and experience at a sensory breadth and depth a physical experience. And of course, when I look at this, I think fat, a signifier comes in the way. Now, maybe this isn't precisely the point that we're trying to make here, but it's a nice illustration of how signifiers overwrite experience. They overwrite perception. Or going back to Johnson's terminology, we have here a kind of overwriting of signifiers of the social cultural domain, which overwrites the vitality of direct experience and perception and so on and so forth. So that means we've kind of covered two themes. We've tried to explore a little bit about the insistent repetitions of the symbolic and how that insistent repetition in a way overlays, overwrites, comes in between me and my experience. Incidentally, you could also say this is one reason that Lacan and Lacanian psychoanalysis is never phenomenological because presumably to be more oriented towards a phenomenological, philosophical outlook, one is trying to perceive things in the wealth of the sensory experience as directly um, as possible. And for Lacanians, the signifier always comes in. The signifier always overrides that experience. Now we can go back Many people will be aware of this, this famous uh, byline, this famous quote in Hegel, uh, the, the, the word is the murder of the thing. I went back to Lacan's decree to make sure that I was getting it right. And here is yet another variation on how the symbolic can be uh, deathly in a sense. The symbolic can be deathly. And here, of course, we know Lacan is borrowing a lot from uh, Hegel. I've already made this point. Words signifies overwrite or replace the things of which they speak. Or as in Hegel, the symbol manifests as the murder of the thing. What do we mean? And again, this is of direct relevance to our discussion of a kind of phenomenological standpoint. Once signifiers start to intervene within our world and we start to understand ourselves and try to perceive our stomachs, directly if signifiers are there they get in the way they in a sense frame and come between me and my own experience so here's the idea the immediate sensory physical comes to be eclipsed by the word the world of unmediated access to things is lost now Lacan doesn't often if ever really refer to the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky but Lev Vygotsky without any reference to the death drive or with any reference to psychoanalysis has a similar idea in as much as he thinks once we are in a domain of signifiers of language or in more Vygotskyan terms, once one has started to use symbolic tools to make sense of the world, which happens a lot earlier than we may think, once we're starting to do that, this idea that we may somehow have unmediated direct access to the world is no longer there. That, I think, gives us a very nice and rather dramatic sense that it's no longer the sense that you have direct, keep on using that word, unmediated access to the sensory world of which you are a part. That's also one of the reasons why you're fundamentally not an animal. Signifiers get in the way of how you perceive. And for that reason, once again, you could say that the, the word, we don't have to be quite so dramatic as to say that the word is the murder of the thing, but the word means that that access to the world no longer exists. It, 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 well, it, it exists, but it's not unmediated. The words come before, they overwrite, they impede. Okay, so we've done a nice couple of uh, improvisations on this theme. Two more to add. One is, and this is what I was trying to think about, Again, very dramatic, but I think it helpfully links death drive to the symbolic and it helps bring the point home for us. There's a moment where Lacan says the negativity of discourse brings into being that which is not. It refers us to non-being. So here's the thesis. We put it the question mark. Is it the case that once we have symbolic systems, we have, as it were, a greater power of negation than we would have otherwise? Let's reiterate that. Once we have symbolic systems, once we have language, such seems to be Lacan's thesis, we can negate with a greater power, with a greater totalizing force than might otherwise be the case. It's an intriguing idea, and in fact, I think it is the case. Here's my example of that. Can we conceive of genocide without language? 
Now, intuitively, you would say, well, genocide is about killing. I don't, it's not you know, really a kind of a linguistic medium or something. But think about it. To have a genocide means that presumably you already must have some kind of symbolic framework for two reasons. One is you need to totalize. You need a totalizing set to include everyone who is of the problematic uh, race or cultural upbringing or religion. Genocide, in that respect, seems to require a certain set of symbolic operations. Not only the totalizing of everyone in the group and the distinction between me and that group, but also that sense of that ongoing differentiation between uh, me and them or them and me. That programmatic attempt to eradicate a whole uh, group of human beings seems to me necessarily to involve a symbolic element. And I think for me, that would be one of the more powerful ways of trying to explore and instantiate Lacan's idea that through language, through the symbolic, we're able to have a greater power, a more horrendous power of, of negation than we would otherwise. Which is also a useful thing to bear in mind because sometimes in, in, in a human science psychology where we're always, like Vygotsky, interestingly enough, trying to say what is it that sets humans apart from animals? There's a great many things you could say, but often the idea of language and symbolic tools is, is prioritized. But when we get out of this, you often have this like, well, humans are so great because they can do this, they can talk, they can communicate, they have a grasp of grammar. But the other thing one could say is that human beings have death drive. In other words, you could also reformulate that and say, well, human beings have the ability to commit genocide. Animals, not so much. And again, to reiterate my argument, I think that is an element of that requires symbolic tools and operations. One last idea, <clears throat> sticking here to the idea, the question, that language potentially enables a more profound form of negation. Much more uh, uh, topical example. Lots of debates about whatever is cancellation culture. What does it mean that we cancel someone, that we decide that Michael Jackson's a little bit questionable, some points in his history, now we're going to cancel him. I don't know, but it seems to me that that is another example of how we have a negation of a more powerful form than simply forgetting, uh, not paying attention to, uh, letting uh, Michael Jackson dissolve into the times of uh, in the mists of history or something. Cancellation culture seems to involve a kind of negativity, a cancellation, which has a force, which may be an aggressiveness as well, but which has a force which is somehow more powerful by virtue of the symbolic operation of negation, which is required to cancel that person. Kind of ongoing symbolic operation of doing that kind of cross out. And I think that form of negation is yet another way of thinking about how there is a certain deathliness or a certain kind of uh, eradication that is enabled through the symbolic, which is not as pertinent in just natural life as it's lived. So those are a bunch of examples. I think we have done enough to try and make the point. One closing thought. You will have seen that in this mini lecture, I've just tried to improvise and think about a whole series of ways in which the symbolic is linked to the deathly. I've tried to do that because it's quite a counterintuitive idea. For most of us, when we think about death, we think about the physicality of mortal demise, of bodies, of corporeality that's no longer sustainable. All of that, I think, is still true, and we will come to that as we develop these lectures. But what I've wanted to try to just open up here is to get a sense of the power of the negative that's made possible via symbolic means, which, of course, is what Lacan's all about here in the 1950s. And to do that, to try to keep us thinking about how the negativity of the symbolic, how the symbolic repeats, how it negates, is of a different order to the type of... Uh, deathliness that we may find in mere organic life. Two points with which to conclude then. The first is to say that as we start to play up some of these examples, there seems to be some ambiguities. Because even within cancellation culture, which brings to bear a kind of symbolic negation, which I think can be quite powerful, you could also say, well, isn't it ironic that in cancellation culture, you could, in an odd kind of way, be said to be giving a new life to Michael Jackson, even though one is trying to cancel him because we need to reiterate who it is that we're cancelling. And in many of these ideas, there seems to be this interplay, this ambiguity. How do we separate fully life and death? Because we've said language is kind of deathly in, amount, in as much as it brings about a certain type of negation, but it's also insistent. It continues. 
in that sense, it's an undead kind of force. It's a kind of odd life, despite that it may have a deathly potential. I want us to keep those ambiguities in mind. They will be important as we move on to the next stage of the theory. Last point then, what about language? My last instantiation of thinking language, the symbolic and deathliness. My idea was, is language itself haunted? And I think in many respects it is because the words, the terms, the profanities we use, they're not invented by us or even our generation. They come from a, another place. They come from the big other and they kind of get reused, rehearsed, reiterated. And then my line of thinking was, language itself is haunted. Language repeats. Could we say that ghosts are made possible by language? And maybe we'll leave it on this hanging question. Is it the case that ghosts are made possible by language? And furthermore, could we not say that ghosts are themselves a wonderful dramatization of the insistent persistence of language, which insists, which goes on, which overwrites me, which overwrites me, which keeps on. And of course, my last rather morbid image for the day is, I'm going to be gone one day. What will be there that will replace me? Well, words. Words, maybe on a tombstone, maybe on a little, uh, what do you call this thing, urn. Words will replace me. Words then seem to be able to overwrite my vitality of being, but also, and here's the ambiguity point again, they will represent me when I'm gone, which means that even in organic death, maybe there's a form of symbolic life.